This is the Resilient Schools podcast on the Bee Podcast Network. I am the creator, Jethro Jones. In this podcast, we help schools become resilient, which means that they are able to adapt and overcome any situation that presents itself. Enjoy the show. This episode is from a previous interview that I did on the Transformative Principle podcast, and I'm collecting all of my trauma-informed podcasts and resources here on this feed. So if you're interested in more of that stuff, stay tuned to future episodes where we talk about how schools can be resilient. And if you want more information, go to resilientschools.com and we can connect and do some training with your staff. Now, here's our episode from the vault. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am excited to have Amy McDonald on as my guest today. Amy, thank you so much for being part of Transformative Principle, and thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you. So we are going to talk because I learned about you and the work you're doing in the strangest of places at a technology conference. So can you tell me a little bit about what you do and, of course, lead up to and include flight school? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what we do is we use uh, experiential activities and to teach and support teenagers and adults to understand the power of having a strong web of support, which then hopefully increases their success later in life. When we talk with teens and adults, we make sure that the process is two-sided, right? That they both participate. So we don't ever talk about working or doing for teenagers. We talk about working and doing with teenagers. And this web of support, as these adults and youth connect, they deepen connections to thicken their web of support. They look at not just the teenagers. You know, many uh, social emotional learning curriculums are very youth-based. Like they look at the student and they look at what the youth can do to build their resiliency, to have a stronger place in the world. We look very differently at the youth, of course, but the youth is one part of seven pieces that we look at that makes up what we call the developmental ecology of a youth. We are very strength-based, so everything we do, we look at from a strength-based side, positive side. So we do lots of um, teacher trainings and in-services, and the greatest event that we do for teenagers is we do a flight club, and the flight club is a anywhere from a one- to four-day event. I live on Prince Wells Island. And on Prince Wells Island, ours are typically three days and two nights. And students come from all over the island. And we spend three days and two nights doing experiential activities, learning about webs of support, learning about how to connect with adults so that adults can um, throw strings to create this web. We eat, sleep, and work in gyms (laughs) wherever we're hosting our flight club. We have as many as 70 kids and 20 adults that come for these um, three-day kind of lock-in events. And we we have fun. Well, it it definitely sounds fun. And so this is done through Kaleidoscope Connect, which is a part of Brightways Learning. Did I get that connection correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a, it's a nonprofit organization that's offices are based in Montana, but they originally started in Alaska and moved their offices to Montana for various reasons of easier access to home for some of the employees and more cost-effective having an office there. And so your day-to-day job then is what? So (laughs) it's kind of an interesting concept. I am technically um, an employee of Southeast Island School District, and Southeast Island School District, along with I think seven or eight other school districts in the state, I'd have to list them, partners with Brightways Learning on some pretty intense Alaska Native Education Program grants. So my position is funded through one of those grants for Southeast Island, but it's fully, it's fully funded through that grant. So I work with Brightways developing trainings and flight clubs and working with local people in all of the districts that they work in in Alaska. Okay. And so this is a a really powerful thing that we just gave a very brief overview. And so I want to dive into a couple of pieces that to help make it make more sense. So kids need support from positive 
appropriate pro-social adults in their lives. Can you talk about the webs of support approach and, and what that actually means? Yeah. So we actually use Roy G. Biv mnemonic to explain it to adults and teenagers. And this is how we explain it. So if you think about what does every teenager in this world need, they need love, right? But there are many different ways, many different people view love differently. So we use, if you think of love as the sun up in the sky and it's warm and you shine it through a prism, you get Roy G. Biv, right? The colors of the rainbow. Yep. And so we use that mnemonic in order to explain what love looks like in our story about a web of support. So the first color is red. And there's research out there that shows that it's optimal for teenagers to have five caring and connected adults in their lives. And these adults can be biologically related or they can be adults in the community. It's, it's very important to point that out because many teenagers think, well, I don't have five biologically caring and connected adults, so I must not have enough. And we know now in our culture, people move, we're a lot more transient, that those adults aren't necessarily biologically related. So red, we call them our anchors. They're the, our rule of five. We say everybody should have five caring and connected adults. Now, I said earlier that we're really strength-based. Oftentimes, teenagers don't have five caring and connected adults in their lives. And we start wherever they are, and we support them to move forward. So if we had a teenager in one of our events that said, gosh, I've only got two, we celebrate two, and we provide opportunities for them to connect with other people, other caring and connected adults. So that's red. And then these adults hold what we call strings. Can I ask a question about the the five? Yeah. So uh, there's a fairly famous Jim Rohn quote that says that you are the average of the five people you hang around with most. Yeah. And so yeah. that relates to this as well. And so it's intentional here that it is five adults and not just older peers yeah. yes. or or anything like that. What's the difference between having an adult versus an older sibling or uncle or, or cousin who's not quite truly an adult yet. Yeah. And, and kids ask that question all the time, right? Because there's also a ton of brain research out there that says kids need to connect with other people their age, right? And so the way we explain it in our story is that a typically like a five-year age difference. So if you're a 15-year-old looking at people that are at least five years older than you, and the way we kind of talk about it is that adults tend to have more life experiences. Uh, adults tend to have more access to resources in some senses. So if you're a teenager who's really, really interested in learning to be a pilot, adults might have access to job opportunities or job shadow opportunities, those kinds of things. We do not ever, though, exclude their friends. We just don't call their friends their anchors, right? So we explain it to them. It's like your five caring and connected adults are like the cake and your friends can be that frosting on the cake. You need to have that strong base of the cake in order to put the frosting on top of it. Yeah. And I really like that approach because it doesn't take away the need for, for peers. It just clearly says, if you don't have five adults in your life, that's something you should be actively searching for yeah. and finding, right? Yeah, exactly. And that, and don't dismiss your friends. It's just in addition to those friends, be looking for adults. Yeah, I like that. That's powerful. All right, let's go on to orange. Okay, so these adults form kind of a circle in in our story. And they it's, it's kind of a, a game between the teenager and the adult that they throw and catch what we call tangible orange and intangible yellow strings. And these strings, tangible strings are things that are easy to answer yes or no, whether you have them. So do you have a safe home? Do you have a safe school? Do you have nutritious food? Do you have appropriate clothing? So those are tangible strings. And those strings are thrown between the adults in your, in your circle. And then the intangible strings are more like virtues and values. So things like integrity and curiosity and a sense of humor, respectfulness, those things. So these orange and yellow strings get thrown around and passed back and forth between the adults and the teenager to create this web of support. In some, in some research, they're called protective factors. We call them strings in our story that build this web of support. So that's orange and yellow. 
And then, so if you're like in your brain thinking of this picture, you've got these red adults standing around in a circle holding these orange and yellow strings, right? Creates a web. Yep, yep. All right, so green is the balloon itself, which is the teenager. And that teenager, there's just like in any school you walk in, there's teenagers that are different sizes, shapes, colors, um, personalities, right? So just like a balloon, lots of different colors, sizes, shapes. So that balloon, we call it the balloon, the green balloon rests on top of the web of support. And we have a, um, when we, when the kids come to our flight clubs, we have an online survey that they take based on these seven factors that I'm talking about right now. And the green one actually measures the size of the balloon. And there are five factors that um, determine the size of the balloon. The first one being gender. Typically, girls are bigger balloons than boys. And they also tend to have more strings in their webs. Now, imagine if you're in a room of 70 teenagers and you say that, right? The comments you get. But it's really, yeah. Important, yeah, it's really important to point out that girls tend to stay connected to anything they connect to for longer periods of time than boys. So, you know, unhealthy relationships, they tend to, tend to stay connected longer. And so it's, it's a good thing for girls to remember that although they may be a little bit bigger balloons, sometimes they need to remember what they stay connected to and how they stay connected to it. So that's gender. So the next one we call the wonder gene. And um, the wonder gene is if you're the kind of person that wonders why you're here or what the purpose of something is in your life or where you're going to be in 20 years. Some people might call it spirituality. If you're the person that thinks that way, then uh, you might be a bigger balloon than people who don't. Uh, the next one is pro-social orientation. And people that are pro-social tend to be bigger balloons than people that aren't. And we're real careful to point out to teenagers that that doesn't mean you're the most popular person in the room. It means that you can walk into the room and feel like you belong there, right? You feel comfortable in a room full of people. So Amy, that one is, is particularly interesting because there are so many issues right now that our kids are facing, including gender confusion <laughs> and um, things like that, where, you know, they often don't feel comfortable. And so that in, in many senses, I, I see that being a very small something that many kids don't have that resiliency already. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And and one of the things that's powerful about measuring the size of the balloon is that it's it's measured by these five different factors. And so if one of those factors, pro-social is a tough one when you're a teenager, right? Tons of brain development that says they're questioning where they are and, and why they're here and what they should be doing and their whole it's Dan Siegel who says it's like this big remodeling of the brain and their brain is like learning and growing faster than any other time in their lives. And and sometimes that's confusing and right. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so one of the powerful pieces of the measuring of the balloon is that that pro-social piece is just a small, just one fifth of the measurement. So teenagers can, can see that that doesn't define them. Only that factor doesn't define them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can you review those five again? Because I think I interrupted you in the middle. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So there's two more I'm going to go through and then I'll go through all five. Of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the fourth one is grit or optimism. And people that tend to have a lot of grit, you know, stick with it. I'm going to get this done no matter what. Or who look at the world through kind of an optimistic lens um, tend to be bigger balloons than people who look through it with a pessimistic lens. And then the last one is we don't ever talk about how smart are you? When we're working with kids, we talk about how are you smart? There's, you know, Howard Gardner's research on multiple intelligences and students who can identify how they learn tend to be bigger balloons than students who can't for reasons like they can um, advocate for themselves with teachers. You know, if their learning style is different than a teaching teacher's teaching style, they can talk to them about it with knowledge saying this is you know this would help me can you give me something that's kinesthetic for the same concept you know those kinds of things to be able to advocate for themselves so five things grit and optimism how am i smart pro-social orientation gender and what we said was the wonder gene yeah so i i like the idea of, of looking at these things and uh recently on the podcast i interviewed tom her who wrote about the 
formative five, which are essentially those five worded a little bit differently, but they have, he contends that those are the the skills that kids need. And so if you go to my website, transformativeprincipal.org, you can search for Tom Her H O E R R in the on the right there and you can find that podcast for him. And that that's a really good different way to look at the the same things that you're talking about and just underscore the importance of having those additional things in place for kids that that they actually can do something about, like knowing how you are smart versus how smart you are that really changes the conversation and focuses on the skills that kids can start to develop because it's their strength. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, Derek Peterson, who is the the thought leader of this whole web support way of thinking, and he's the one that created Flight Club. And he came to Southeast Island School District actually in the 90s and did some work with some teenagers and uh, teachers. And to prove this point, the, the teenagers kind of threw him for a loop, but to prove this point of how am I smart versus how smart am I, he asked the teenagers in the room to stand up and from smartest to least smartest to form a line. And the teenagers just kind of looked at him for a while. And then finally a couple, one of the, or two of the teenagers were like, Derek, so how do you want to gauge it? Like, what kind of smarts are you talking about? Are you talking about being able to survive out in the woods? Are you talking about book smart? Are you talking about interpersonal smart? And he was like, holy cow, right? These kids know how to talk about who they are and what they, what they can do. And that's a huge confidence and um, esteem booster. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when I think about that, I I think about how often we underestimate kids and their ability and, you know, think they can't figure these things out on their own, but they they do and they think about it and we just need to give them space to be able to talk about it with us too and let us into their minds, right? Right. And you know, one of the the other thing that's really powerful to me about this whole story is that we have this structure in our society of like a, um, like a power differential, right. Between adults and kids. And especially in schools, sometimes I think, you know, Oh, I'm the principal or I'm the teacher and you're the student. And one of the things that I think happens when you have this common language and kids know who they are as people and where their strengths lie, that that power differential kind of shifts and it lessens a little bit. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, I'm your teacher, there should be some respect there. But if we can get that power differential a little bit lower, think of the conversations we can have with with youth that are that are so powerful. Oh, absolutely. I love that idea. Because once you give them a voice, you allow them to, to be the ones who are contributing in a way that you, as I mentioned, you don't expect them to be able to do, but they totally can. And it's real. Yeah. Yeah, real. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So pretty cool. Pretty powerful stuff. Okay, so let's move on to blue. Yep. Okay, so blue. Blue in our story, um, we call scissors cuts. And we talk about scissors cuts or things that are in control or sometimes out of control of the youth. And there are things that cut away at those strings in their web. So for an example of an in control behavior would be too much screen time. Right. If you spend too much time on your phone or on your video game, then it decreases the time that you interact with humans, with people, right? So that might cut some of your strings. One that might be out of con- the control of a youth might be one of their anchors is a teacher and that teacher moves away to go to a different school. That doesn't mean that that teacher drops all of those strings, but the way or the number of strings that they hold may change because they're holding from a distance versus um, right there in the school. So scissors cuts are things that happen that can affect the web that can cut some of those strings in the web. Indigo is caring for the carers. And we uh, recognize and we want all teenagers to recognize that their anchors need a web of support as well. And not that we would ever ask a teenager to be an anchor to an, to an adult, but we might ask them to show real gratitude. So instead of saying, hey, Miss Smith, thanks for the class today, you might say, Hey, Ms. Smith, I really enjoyed class today. That activity we did, specific activity we did was a lot of fun. You know, so showing gratitude that's clear and um, specific. The other thing we might ask them to do as teenagers is to kind of be observant and pay attention to the anchors in their web. 
So if they notice that an anchor is maybe having an off day and they're comfortable, they could um, access one a different anchor and let that one kind of deal with their situation, right? Not add to it. And then violet is social norms. And social norms we talk about as that wind that goes through your web and positive social norms can lift your web up and help keep that balloon buoyant on top of the web. Uh, negative social norms can be that wind that pushes your web down. And in some areas of the world, those negative social norms are so strong that people choose not to live there, right? We also um, make sure that when we talk to teenagers about social norms, that we validate the idea that um, changing negative social norms is really, really difficult, but amplifying positive social norms is a lot easier. So we try to identify positive social norms that are happening in their schools and communities and talk about ways that they can increase those positive social norms or add value to those positive social norms. So yeah, that's our story. <laughs> yeah. So I love it. And so I'm just going to review those real quick. Red's the rule of five, five anchors, yep. orange, and yellow are tangible and intangible uh, strings respectively. Yep. Green is resiliency and growing the balloon yep. and blue is scissor cuts or problem reductions. Mm -hmm. Indigo is caring for the carers, and violet is social norms. So, Amy, we talked about each of the strings and the anchors and the balloons. And when you talk about the balloon, that is the the child, that refers to them uh, landing on a web of supports and not falling through that web. Is that a good way to visualize what you're talking about? Yeah, it's a great way. And and to keep in mind that it's kind of the teenager's job to push through those cracks sometimes, right? And that we that's, right. that's, that's what's happening in their brains, right? That whole remodeling idea. And that we that the goal is for the teenagers to have a strong enough web that they have supports to push them right back up through it. You know, there's a reason it's not a piece of plywood teenagers push through. So to have those supports that they can come right back up on top of their web after they fall through or push through. <laughs> That seems like a duh kind of thing, but it's it's important for those things to be in place because it's yeah. it's so easy for kids to to fall through. Yeah. So you you mentioned before that you take this survey at flight school. Can you talk a little bit about what that survey entails and and what you find out? Yeah, for sure. So we call the survey the student support card. And when we're talking to people about it, we kind of refer to it as the other side of the report card. The survey takes there's a survey for each of the colors, Reggie Biv. Some of the colors have a couple of extra surveys in them, like the green one has a um, couple of extra sur surveys in it. So the kids at flight school, at flight camp club, we go in and we do activities and we learn about red. We do some pre-survey activities in is a large group. And then they go in and we have, um, they can either do it on their computers or they can do them on um, tablets or their phones, whatever device they want to use. And they log in. It's theirs personal. They have their own um, login and password. And um, we're pretty clear with them that nobody else sees it unless they give somebody else permission to see it. So after we do red, do the pre-survey activities, they go in and they take a red survey, which it asks them to identify people who are anchors in their lives. So they might say, my mom is an anchor. She's my mom. And then there's 10 statements and they check whichever statements apply to their mom. And that those 10 statements then determine the proximity of that anchor. So we talk about anchors being caring, therefore near to and tight with. And the tighter your anchor is, obviously the closer your connection is, right? That doesn't mean that all of your anchors need to be tight. Anchors can be therefore near to also. And, and they're still just as you know much of an anchor. So the, each of the colors have these surveys that they take. And when they're finished with them all, they get what we call a kaleidoscope snapshot. And it's basically a, a bar graph, but it's in a circle. And it shows their colors. So if they have 50% red, there's calculations on the backside, you know, that figure out the calculations. Then the, the bar for red would be halfway around the circle. If they have 30% orange, it would be 30, a third of the way around and so forth. So they see this kaleidoscope snapshot at the end, and we have what we call full color dialogue, where we use very strength-based questions to talk to them. We focus on their 
strongest colors first. So if they have really strong red, but their social norms, their violet is really small. We don't even address violet right away. We just start, we talk about red and who their anchors are and why their anchors are, why they are their anchors. The idea is that the tighter connected you are with students, the more appropriate it would be for you to talk about the colors that are less strong in their kaleidoscope snapshot. So that becomes a, a probably a conversation later, right? If that student chose to show their anchor, their snapshot. The other thing that happens in the student support card is um, at the end, after they've done all the surveys, uh, there's a it's programmed so that their three top colors come up and there's some activities that they do, some questions they answer, some data they input based on those three colors. And the result of that is what we call their focus declaration. It's kind of a mission building. It's a mission building statement process. So in the end, they come out with this, we call focus declaration that talks about the kind of person that they want to be. And at the end, they can email it to themselves or email it to one of their anchors or to their teachers or whoever, so that they can share that focus declaration with um, other people. So that, I mean, this all sounds really powerful. And if you go to the show notes at transformativeprinciple.org, you can see what this, this card, student support card looks like, and you can see a sample of it. And I've, I've got a link there to it. And I really like this because you talked about if the red is not full yet, then it's not a full ring. Then you start working on that. And did I understand that right? That you, you start with the red and you move down from there to give them the proper supports. Is that right? We kind of start, we, we start with whichever colors are the strongest. With the strongest, thank you. Yeah, so if red was their strongest, that'd be a great place to start. Um, if it's not, then we start other places and and work towards that. And and you know, like I said, if I like if I were to sit down with one of my students at my school and I saw that their red was very small, if I'm connected enough with them, I could start that conversation. If I'm not connected enough with them, I really don't. It, it really wouldn't be a productive conversation for me to start with them until I am more connected with them. And Amy, this is like. This is not rocket science, right? And no. we all know the kids that we have a poor relationship with. Mm -hmm. If we start talking to them about how their life should be or whatnot, right. they're not going to give us the time of day. And, and being able to have a framework for talking about it, I think, is so powerful. And so if it's somebody that I've got a great relationship with, then, yeah, I could talk about that. Doesn't mean I have to, but I could. And if I don't have a great relationship, then... It's a waste of time, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, one thing we've really noticed in our schools that have been teaching this framework for quite some time is that if there's a kid in our district who's struggling and, you know, I'm technically the school counselor kind of, right? And a teacher might call me and say, hey, will you fly out to the school and go talk to this kid? It used to be that they would ask me to go out there. And now what they say is, Amy, who's connected to that kid? Who could we get to go out there and support that kid? Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> right? So it's a, it's a different conversation. It's not about, oh, just because you're the counselor, you should go take care of it. We know that doesn't work, right? It's not a good model. Yeah. Can, can I support that person going and working with that kid? Absolutely. But am I necessarily the right person? Not always. Yeah. And so as we're, we're thinking about this, there are many different ways to provide that support. But how do you get kids to buy into it in the first place? Because <laughs> that sounds like a challenge. Let's talk about that. That's a really good question. And that leads us into talking about Flight Club. So Flight Club is super fun. Kids come to Flight Club the first time because it's fun. They don't come because, I, I, I shouldn't say nobody, but typically they don't come because they're looking to add anchors or thicken their web of support. Typically they come because their friends are coming and we do all kinds of experiential activities. You know, we do trust falls. We pick people up and fly them around the gym, like Superman flying. We um, do the electric fence where everybody's inside and they all have to get outside by going over the fence. You know, so lots of fun experiential activities. We sleep on the floor of the gym. We have a dance, whatever food we can find because teenagers are starving all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just a real bonding kind of activity. So that's why they come the first time because it's fun. And everybody's like, oh, let's go to flight club. It's really fun. We find that they do their surveys the first time and they're, um, it's kind of over-reported, like more anchors, more, you know, their webs look super strong the first time. And then the next time they come, and we have them twice a year, we have one in the fall and one in the spring. 
The next time they come, we find that their their kaleidoscope snapshot has less color in it. They're learning the concepts the second time. So, so really the enticing to come is how much fun it is. And then when they see the value, they really do see the value and they, they connect with the adults that come to flight club first. I mean, they might be connected to other people too, but they always connect to the adults that come to flight club because we're all doing the same thing. You know, if a kid's doing a trust fall off a bleacher into a group of kids, so am I, right? Everybody does the activities. So there's a ton of connection that builds there and they start to see the value of connecting with adults and of trusting adults to help them build their webs of support. And so are those 20 adults to 70 kids, are those 20 adults there to be those anchors or are they just there to support the process? Both. And it's interesting because sometimes it's hard to get adults to come to those kinds of activities. And we have a teacher in our school district who was new to our school district and came to flight club first thing in August maybe early September, her first year here. And she will tell you hands down that the reason that she stayed in this district was because of Flight Club. She connected with kids. She connected with other adults. She felt like she had a common language with all of us. She teaches on a remote site. There's only two teachers and 25 kids or something. So the adults that come, they, you know, we require adults to come because that's a whole idea, right? Kids connecting with adults. But when the adults come, they learn and see the value just like the kids do. And it helps them then when they go back to their school sites to understand how to connect better with kids who didn't come to flight club. We expect them to um, participate as much as their bodies will allow them. (laughs) Yeah, that's certainly interesting. And those teachers from rural sites will come in for this with their kids. And so that, that helps them provide a build a bond and become anchors for them. But then do you have people that aren't at that rural site that participate in the flight club as well? Absolutely. And we have parents that come. We have one of our partners in the grant is the local mental health organization, and they send adults to it. Our superintendent comes. Um, community members sometimes come. They don't typically stay the whole time, but they drop in for chunks of time. And uh, this year, actually, we've changed. We have an application process for kids to come, and we don't turn kids away, but we just have to have, you know, permissions and those kind of things for the application process. And um, we've added a page to the application process for them, for the kids to individually invite adults to come, because it would be perfect if we had like one adult at one kid, right? That would be like a beautiful picture. Wow. So we're trying to increase. Although we have pretty good adult participation here, but um, we're always trying to increase it. Sure. So what does it take for someone who's listening to this and we've got listeners all over the all over the world listening? What does it take for them to start implementing some of these things in their schools? Yeah, well, we can come and do staff trainings at schools if people are interested. We can do flight clubs without the staff training, although I, I do think that having the staff training first helps with kind of the systemic implementation of things because your staff then knows what the kids are talking about. But the best way to do it would be to go to Brightways Learning's website and send an email or send an email to me and I could put you in the right direction and we could start a discussion about what might be useful at your school or at your district and um, go from there. Okay. Well, well, that sounds great. And I will put a link to Brightways Learning in the show notes at transformativeprinciple.org slash episode 230. So you can go find that easily. And that will be a great, great thing for you to do. So Amy, can in closing, can you just share uh, one or two stories of powerful impacts that have been had because of Flight Club and, and teaching kids how to about all of this web of support? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, typically people often think that events like this and frameworks like this are only for what we would say small balloons. But we had a, a girl come to one of our flight clubs who's a huge balloon. Balloon. She has many anchors, lots of strings. Her web is very thick. She's a very big balloon. And she was a senior in high school. And she went back to her high school after coming to flight club. And she told her principal that, her principal needed to change the way she was thinking because flight club was really for everybody, not just for troubled kids. And then um, her name's Jill. She went on to college and it was kind of a scary transition for her. 
and kind of, you know, move away from our whole web, right? We live in a pretty small rural community, moved away from her web and went to college. And she sent me a, um, an email after her first set of finals. And she said, Amy, I was so worried about my finals. She said, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was crying. I didn't know what to do. And one of the things I forgot to mention this, one of the things we do at flight club is we have index cards and you get an index card for every other person that's at flight club. And during the time you're there, you learn something about them and you write two positive comments about them on their card. So everybody leaves what we, what we call their stack. So Jill says to me, I'm so worried about my finals, like sick to my stomach, you know, and I knew that wasn't a good way to go into them. And she said, I pulled out my stack from flight club and I read my cards and she said, I went into my finals the next day. She said, and I did really well, like boosted my confidence, told me who I really was as a person that, that I was forgetting, right. That all these things that other people saw in me that I was forgetting. Um, so that was a pretty powerful story. That stack was that powerful to her. Yeah. And that she kept it all that time. And, and, she kept, yeah. oh, and kids keep them. I'm telling you, Jethro, they keep them. I've, there's a student in a community down the road and she, the inside of her bedroom door is plastered. She's been to nine flight clubs, I think, plastered with her stacks. Another one keeps them on the inside of her locker. Another one I know keeps them in their backpack. You know, they just, they keep them. Yeah, that just sounds awesome, man. Uh, Amy, thank you so much for sharing all this uh, with us. And I hope those of you who are listening that if you have some ideas about some of the ways that you can help build your kids up, you'll check out Bright Ways Learning and be able to implement some of these things and hopefully get a flight club at your school and really find a way to build those webs of supports for students. So Amy, thank you again so much for being part of Transformative Principle. Yeah, thank you very much. It was fun.